In the last series of videos dealing with negligence, we were dis discussing the idea about how we establish someone's actions are negligent. In fact, we dealt with the first two requirements. The first requirement is that the defendant owes the plaintiff a duty of care, and that the second is that the defendant breached that duty of care. What we're going to do now is to move on from that and look at the situation where we decide whether the defendant's breach actually caused the harm. Okay, so this is called causation. Some people call it causation, and it involves two elements, factual causation, and that that causation is within the scope of liability. It's, it's found, this particular test is found in section 11 of the Civil Liability Act. So why don't we have a look at section 11? Now, you'll remember that one of the ways to actually find the law is to just type in the particular act that I'm looking for, the Civil Liability Act of Queensland, because it's Queensland legislation, brings it up, and Section 11 is causation. So the general principles of causation are a decision that a breach of duty caused particular harm comprises the following elements. The breach of duty was a necessary condition of the occurrence of the harm. Okay, so it's got to be a necessary condition, which is called factual causation. So did the breach actually cause the harm? The second is with respect of policy, whether it's appropriate for the liability of the person to extend to this kind of breach of harm, the scope of liability. So that's the section. 11.1 that contains the key test that we're interested in looking at. So just to recap, we're dealing with section 11 of the Civil Liability Act, and the test is whether there is factual causation and whether it's appropriate for that causation to uh, be within the scope of liability of the defendant. In factual causation, what we're trying to establish is whether the defendant's carelessness caused the actual harm. That's what we're trying to do. The courts have traditionally used the but-for test. But for the defendant's carelessness, would the plaintiff have suffered the harm? A case that can help us think about that, that we don't need to remember for the exam, but a case that helps establish that fact is Barnett and the Chelsea Kensington Hospital Management Committee. So in this particular instance, uh, we've got this hospital and, and a patient comes to the hospital complaining uh, about a very bad stomach ache and they're probably vomiting and there's all kinds of problems. Now, unfortunately for the hospital, the doctor who is rostered on is away. They're actually sick. They're at home. They're in their own bed because they've got the flu. So what happens is the patient comes in and the nurse who's on duty rings the doctor and describes what's going in. The doctor who's home in bed doesn't come into the hospital or doesn't decide uh, to get someone else, another doctor, to come in and have a look. And they say to the patient, hey, you go home, come back in the morning when someone's on duty. Now, unfortunately, the patient actually dies. So... Here, the courts establish clearly the doctor owes the patient a duty of care. It's an established category. They also agreed that the doctor had breached that duty of care. You know, a reasonable person would have taken precautions. Uh, the risk was foreseeable. It was not insignificant, etc. So the doctor would have either got someone or come in themselves out of their sickbed to actually look at the patient. However, one of the things that I haven't mentioned yet was that the patient was actually poisoned. And the evidence showed that the patient would have died whether or not the doctor examined them. The patient was always going to die. So let's use this test. But for the doctor's carelessness, but for the doctor not coming in, would the plaintiff have suffered the harm? In this case, actually, yes, they would have suffered the harm no matter what the doctor did because they were poisoned and they were always going to die. So here, there was no factual causation. So we have to answer this but for test as no, right? But for the defendant's carelessness, would the plaintiff have suffered the harm? Um, so 
It has to be the cause. So state it another way. Let's take that negative out of it. In the, if in the absence of the carelessness the plaintiff would not have suffered harm, then the harm was caused by the carelessness. As simply as possible, did the act or omission, the carelessness, actually cause the harm or would the harm have occurred without that carelessness? The second element of the test is around scope of liability. So people aren't liable for everything that occurs as a result of their carelessness. The court has to decide where does their liability begin and end. And in order to do that, we look at this reasonable foreseeability um, of the harm that's caused. If the harm is too remote or far-fetched, then it's not reasonably foreseeable and the defendant won't be liable for that harm. I'd encourage you to go back and look at our discussion of reasonable foreseeability uh, from the previous lecture or the previous vodcast around that if that's unclear to you. So just to summarise, negligence only arises if the harm has been caused by the breach of duty. That requires factual causation and it also requires that the harm is within the scope of liability, which is the reasonable person test. Remember our factual causation is the but-for test used by the courts. If we've established that the, the defendant owed the plaintiff a duty of care and if the defendant has breached that duty of care under section 9 and if that breach caused the harm under section 11 then the defendant looks like they're going to be liable for the negligence in their action. However, the defendant also has two defences that we're going to cover, two ways of combating the argument, voluntary assumption of risk and contributory negligence. And we're going to move on to them in our next couple of videos.